depends on its age. It's, going to, it's not going to last as long if you gas it back. So, but the biggest thing is that I relate to is it's hard to back for a battery. I mean, it really is. It's like, ah, and, and so if you want a battery to last longer, you simply don't jump them. If you jump them, you will, you will shorten life by at least a year. So I get a lot of people go, well, what can I do without spending any money? Well, okay, keep the battery charged up. If you're going to just use the premise that you can start the motor or drive to keep your battery charged up, you've got to do it long enough that you fully charge your battery. Okay, not partially charge your battery, you want to fully charge your battery, or it doesn't help. It's not good for the battery to keep it. You know, you know, you're not, now, it might be good for the motor and all that kind of stuff. That, that's great. But you're not going to prolong the life of the battery. Does anybody else want to insert a little quieter? So, um, so let, let me get into it, and, and, and feel free to ask, ask any questions that are per, pertinent to your, your own situation, but um, people quite often come in and go, oh, well, there's a whole bunch of different type of batteries I can buy, what kind do I need, and do I need to spend the money on these new fancier batteries and stuff like that? So let me tell you my opinions on batteries, basically. I mean, I, I've got a couple AGM batteries and, and a couple of my cars. Oh, by the way, Maybe I should also explain um, how I got into the battery charger business. I've been in the computer business for 40 years, and I made big power supplies for computers and big RAID systems, hard drive systems. I've been doing that for 40 years. Fortunate enough to make some money at that business, and, and my passion is cars. And so I've got a bunch of cars. You know, if you've got a bunch of cars, you've got a bunch of batteries that are going dead on you and stuff. And I had, when, when um, Battery tenders came out 30 years ago. I bought them. And I tell you what, I have nothing bad to say about my competitor. They were the first guys out there that made something. I thought that was pretty cool. I put them on my cars. How I got into this business was about just about 10 years ago. I had 30 cars in my little collection. And I had tenders on everything and stuff. And, and uh, battery still died. And, and the problem with the tender is it had a green light on it, but it doesn't necessarily mean the battery's good. You can, uh, tenders, the green light doesn't mean good and the red light doesn't mean bad. That it just means that with it on there, plugged into the wall, if, uh, if the voltage shows, you know, 13 volts or 13 point something, 13 point six, the green light will stay on. If the battery goes bad, it just stays on anyway. It doesn't care and stuff. And so, you know, um, so I was replacing battery steel with tenders on it. And the thing that, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back is we were, we were taking a, Tour on a Sunday, my wife and I and stuff, and she's getting the picnic ready, and I got the green light, and it was a Viper. I have a, I've got old cars too, but I, just so it happened that it was a Viper tour. If anybody's owned an older Viper, the battery is behind the rear wheel. So changing your battery out in, uh, you know, real quick is not an easy process. It, it, and, and first of all, I don't like getting down on the ground because of my weight and stuff, and I'm here with this stupid, and, and it took me a couple hours to get the battery changed out, and I said, you know what, when I get back home, I'm gonna look at these chargers I got. I had a variety of different types, and I'm going to make something better. And that's how I got into the, uh, into the battery charger business and stuff. I probably know way more than I ever want to know about bad batteries. And, you know, it's just one of those things. But if you live with batteries, and we seem to be living with batteries, there's, and there are all types of new batteries, the more you know about something, the better off you are. I don't, I've replaced batteries to find out if it was voltage regulated. Uh, you know, it's the easiest thing to replace if the battery goes bad. You think, it's a battery, but it doesn't mean it's a battery. It's not charging stuff. So uh, anyway, I, 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 this is not a sales pitch for my, my battery charges, but that's how I got into those. Now let's get back to what I was talking about originally, and that is different types of batteries. What do you buy? In my opinion, standard lead acid batteries are still the best bang for the buck. They are just simply the best bang for the buck. Now you got to realize that there's only four companies making them, really. Not like the older days when I was a kid, there was probably two or three hundred companies making them. And when you saw different labels, they were made by different people. Today, you see different labels, and they're made by the same factory. They just are spec'd differently for whoever wants to come in and buy them from, from these different companies. So you're not buying necessarily different batteries uh, are made by different people. They may be the same company making them. Um, but standard, good old-fashioned lead-acid batteries, if you take care of them, are great. One of the things I do when I go into a store is I, I, I got a, a little voltmeter with me. Take a voltmeter, or we have a little tester built in our 
and things. I test the battery for voltage because I don't care. I don't know when they put those stickers on when you buy them. They could put them on whenever they feel like, and I don't really necessarily trust them. They probably be put the old, if they're like me and, and, and you're a retailer, you put the old inventory in front. Well, I, I don't want to buy a battery. So I look for the highest voltage. And the second thing is if I'm buying brands, you look for the highest amount of weight. You want the heaviest battery you can buy in whatever class you're buying. It means it's got more lead in it. And let me just tell you how they cost for these batteries. They make the plates so, so thin today that their, their design will last only a couple, three years. And so the lead plates can wear out where we never used to have that plate rolls. You know, but now the plates are so close to each other. So the heavier the battery, you're getting more for your, more, more battery for your thing. So even if you just lift it up, it's just, you know, um, it's good to do that. But let's get on to, uh, on to different batteries. The newest thing that's happened, or not the newest thing, but the, the thing that's happened uh, in the last 20 years or so are called AGM batteries. And I, I'm assuming everybody here heard of them. Uh, uh, let me tell you how they how they came uh, how they came to life. They weren't made for cars. They were originally made for emergency lights and medical equipment. And the reason they were made for emergency lights and medical equipment is those batteries sit around a long time and they don't move. And 20 years ago, the battery chargers were very simple trickle chargers. But when I was mentioning that, that batteries stratify, that the water goes to the top and the sulfuric acid goes to the bottom, well, those batteries, they were using lead acids, that, that, that's, they would separate. So that you'd have to change the batteries out every three to six months. Well, they wanted something better. So they come out with the original word for it was gel batteries. AGM batteries and batteries are the same thing. It's just how they go about holding the sulfuric acid and the water together so they don't separate. So we came out with, they came out with, and AGM stands for absorbed glass mat. What they're saying is instead of just water or water and sulfuric acid where you got a wet bat, they call it wet battery, they, they, they created a gel. And, and now they created an absorbed glass mat between the plates, which holds those things together, with, it doesn't let them separate. They, they still separate, it takes about a year. But if you're gonna store a battery and you're not gonna use it, and you're not gonna plug it into a charger, an AGM battery is a better solution. AGM batteries also like the Optimus and stuff, a lot of customers have Optimus are better uh, for vibration. But short of the vibration and the fact that you don't use the battery and you want it to last, you know, and, and you, you're gonna leave it sit, you're not gonna plug it in or you can't plug it in, um, AGM batteries are twice as much money. And so dollars and cents twice, I, I've got a couple cars, I, oh, and the other, let me give them another uh, point. Um, they have more amp hours usually, about 100 more amp hours. So if you've got a high performance car, I, I, I've got two of their, two Optima batteries. If you got a high performance car, um, then you might want that. But other than those reasons, unless you're just burning money, good old fashioned lead acid batteries still, still the best bang for the buck, that, that are out there stuff. So, now, deep cycle versus starting batteries. That's another question that people have, okay? And, and most everybody understands that a deep cycle battery is slightly different. What a deep cycle battery is designed to do is be able to go down in voltage lower and not get hurt. A starting battery wants to stay above 11.7 volts always. 11.7 volts, Sounds like it's still pretty good, but I tell you what, 11.7 volts may not start a car. It's a, a battery's gotta be in the 12 volt range for most cars, 11.7. And modern cars with electronics, they may not fire at, at down there and stuff. So, so when you get a battery below 11.7, as far as functionality is concerned, it's not a very good battery. I mean, it's, it's too low to really do you any good. So they, they come out with the deep cycle batteries because what they're intending that you're gonna do with this thing is you're gonna wanna run your lights or your load or whatever the item is for a lot, as long as you possibly can. So the voltage will go down below 11.7, but most 12 volt items will run down to around 10 or nine and a half. And so you've got maybe two times the storage capacity uh, that you would have out of, a, uh, out of a normal battery. So that's why they've got deep cycles. Now let's just talk about the two things that you look for. There's a thing called amp hours and there's a thing called cold cranking amps. And batteries are rated in both. And, and Cold cranking amps obviously is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, the amps that a battery can produce at freezing, okay? The higher, the stronger the battery. 
doesn't mean that the battery is going to last longer as far as what you pull off of it. The amp hour is going to be smaller bit. It's just how much push it can give you to start a motor. Well, if you've got high performance, you want a lot of push, you go for a higher cold crank. If you've got a deep cycle battery, then you'd be more concerned with the amp hours. Uh, 100 amp hours, uh, you know, there's one amp for 100 hours and stuff. Uh, uh, 10 amps for 10 hours. It, it's, it's got more storage capabilities than, say, 50 or a 20 or, uh, or a smaller battery. And so for, for when you're designing something around that, you, you want to go for the maximum amount of amp hours if you're talking about a trailer or a motorhome. So, so, um, so I, does everybody understand those two concepts and stuff? I, if you've got if you've got cars, we've all been there and stuff. Cold cranking amps is usually the thing. We well, back up a minute. If you've got standard lead acid, maintenance free lead acid. What's the difference on them? You don't see the removable gaps on them. Yeah, I mean, and really, what, the maintenance free um, means they're vented slightly different. Okay, so, so most batteries today are called maintenance free, maintenance -free. And, and even uh, there's there's still holes. Even if they put a label over the holes, those holes are still there. You can actually put, mm, we, two of our markets that we do really good in are um, Florida and Arizona, okay? <laughs> and because you're, you're torturing your battery when you're at 120 or 130 degrees in your garage. And, and they evaporate, uh, you know, so people go, well, what else can I do for keeping my batteries alive longer? I go move to Hawaii, they love Hawaii. Um, because you've got 70 to 80 degrees and you've got humidity, so you're not going to get evaporation, and that's how to make a battery last a long time. Keep it between 70 and 80. Well, that's not the world. And stuff. So in Arizona, batteries die prematurely because of evaporation and heat. Well, there's nothing wrong with if you, you know, with if you've got a battery and you can see the capsule, the capsule come off, or you can easily get the label on. Filling it back up with water, that distilled water, of course, but you can do it. And you can make your batteries last longer if you want to. So there's there, there's certainly nothing wrong with doing that as far as I'm concerned. Um, now the other thing that kills batteries prematurely is cold. Um, and what happens with cold is when they're not being used. And the reason that in storage, if you've got a place in the cold, and we have a place up in Michigan, we have a place in California, the batteries in California inherently last longer because they hate to be you know brought down to 20 below because if your battery has been sitting there and it's not on something that's exercising it, your cars don't have that effect. But if your battery is sitting there, the water is at the top. It's separated. It's sulfated. I'm mean, sulfated. It's stratified. Well, and water, as it freezes, expands. And even if it doesn't crack the outside shell, your plates, the lead plates are so thin that they're doing this as it thaws and as it freezes. And so what you end up with is you end up with cracks. And even if the crack doesn't kill the battery right away, it will kill it. In a, in a short amount of time. And so that's another thing about batteries. You, if you're in super cold and you don't have a choice, you've got to drive that battery. And if you don't drive that battery, you should definitely look into something that exercises the battery while you're not using it. If you don't, it, they will die prematurely. Again, but I, you know, we're up in our places in the UP and stuff, and I, I keep things last winter of my one of my barns not heated and stuff that's more of my lawnmower and stuff like that but I have I have our units on there and the exercising that the pulsing does keeps them from freezing um, so you want to if you can how does your unit exercise the battery it draws current and recharges both ways yeah yeah it discharges and recharges and stuff and it puts out an ultrasonic pulse so the ultrasonic pulse what it does is it repels the sulfur from the walls of the plates Okay, so it's in that matter of fact, how, how we do it is we reverse the polarity. Oh. Which you would normally not be able to do. You blow up a battery, you try to reverse the polarity on it, or if you ever plug a battery in backwards, when you're jumping into stuff, you know what I'm talking about, you're hoping for no explosion. And I'll bring you to the, into the last little thing about explosions. I have been privy enough to never have had an explosion myself. Lucky, as I, you know, sometimes when, I wouldn't pay attention. I'd jump cars where you know you, you've connected to the other car first. You should always connect your jumper cables to the car you're jumping, and then go over to the car that you're jumping from, so we don't get sparks at that battery that there. Because if you get sparks and you've got any hydrogen gas, 
it will blow up. And it can happen, and that's usually when it does happen. It doesn't usually happen for the fun of it, it usually happens when you're futzing with it and it needs a spark to set off the hydrogen gas. Two things about maintaining batteries, too. If you keep the voltage up, you're not gonna get as much hydrogen gas. Um, if you keep the level of the battery, now I'm talking about maintenance or non-maintenance batteries, old-fashioned batteries. If you've got any old-fashioned batteries, you keep them full. Don't let them go down because if the hydrogen gas gets trapped in the top part of the of the um, cavity, that's where the hydrogen gas is hanging out. Also, it's hanging out around the plates and stuff. If you ever wonder why the white stuff on the outside of your battery, where it comes from, that's called hydrogen sulfate. It's the battery, all batteries gas, all batteries will vent, even, even AGMs, even though you can turn them upside down and stuff, they have two little holes there. If they get too critical, they will gas instead of blow up and stuff. So the problem with hydrogen sulfate, when the hydrogen's coming out with the, with the sulfur, is they get attracted to the post. They want to they just go right there. So if you've got a battery that's got a, you've had a problem with that hydrogen gas, the only, there is nothing, there's no solution really, because it's still going to be uh, attracted, other than keeping the level up high and keeping the dang battery vented. Never, ever put a, a blanket or something over the top of the battery in storage. Kiss of death, because you're going to attract, you don't, you want ventilation. And if, if you've got a battery like that, I, I, you know, and you're going to store it, leave the hood up a few inches and stuff, let it, let it breathe. Uh, when, you know, because you'll have a lot less hydrogen sulfur. We're always sticking with a stainless steel box or plastic box or something. Well, you know. Sure, that's in the box somewhere. Right. Well, vents are, are the most important things, old-fashioned batteries that there are. If you're going to go with non-vented boxes, you're better off with an AGM battery because it, it, you know, it has less venting than a maintenance-free or, or a maintenance battery. But, um, yeah, uh, venting is, is definitely, venting and temperature I mean, are just you know, really important things. Um, yeah, I wrote an article, it's in there on, on, um, on, on uh, battery explosions and stuff like that. And, and the, the guy that I wrote about is a friend of mine. He's up, up in Pacific Northwest and stuff, and he had a $2 million Ferrari. And, and it, it's a few, I, I mean, you can't really see from the pictures or And um, he, he put a blanket over the top of it, and then he took the blanket off, and he put jumper cables on it, and just went right to the battery, and this sucker blew. And he was lucky. I mean, he was just, he wore, he wore glasses, and that was good, but it just, when that happens, what you want to do, obviously, get to a doctor if it's you, but if it's your car, wash it. Wash it down big time. Use as much water, because you'll dilute, you know, but if you don't dilute that, that, that sulfuric acid, it eats through everything. It'll eat through your shirt, it'll eat through, you know, and that right brings me to another thing. I think these guys have stopped doing this, but for a while there was some, some guy that should be in jail advertising that you can restore any battery made just give him the $39 or $49, and he will tell you how to, the miracle way to restore your batteries. Full of hogwash, totally full of hogwash, and people paid him and stuff, and I, maybe maybe our government did something good there and it stopped him. Um, he's telling people to, to take the sulfuric acid out of a battery and you can clean it out. Nobody in their right mind plays with a battery unless you're set up for that. I mean, uh, you, 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 you know, it, that's, it's terrible because it's dangerous. It's sulfuric acid. It's called acid. It eats, it'll eat right through your clothes and, and, and your skin and stuff. And so, so who in this world, other than a, a, a company that can, you know, does that for a living, who in this world would possibly want to do that? This guy was, a, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm just thankful he's not telling people. The, the just simple good maintenance on your stuff and, and, and uh, taking care of your battery and batteries and, and servicing them periodically. We'll get you a couple more years of life out of your batteries. Just, just that simple amount of your life and all this stuff is, is important. Maintenance and stuff. So, any questions or any stories? I always like to hear stories. Anybody have a horror story? Yeah. Yeah. It always makes everybody else feel better when you, you, know, you <clears throat> tell them. I've witnessed a few battery exposures. Usually, when the usually the aftermath, when I because I had, had a service station and I'd go to the telway of cars or something trying to jump start their car, and there were the paint was already shot. The guy was in the hospital. 
parts of plastic batteries were all over the place. Yeah, I understand yeah. it sounds like a loudest boom you can ever have. And I have also witnessed one in my own garage where the kid that works for me was going to charge a battery and said, there's a light bulb inside this battery. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Get away from me. And, yeah. And he actually hooked up the battery charger and it was glowing. I oh, just unplug it from the wall, get away from it. And it was too late. It already it just popped. Right. Bounced off the floor, split the case open, and passed it all over the place. But something in that battery became a filament, no longer a conductor. And woof. And it was glowing. Right. And, but it didn't nobody got hurt at least. But right. it was it was frightening to see from 20 feet away while well, it's moving towards the people. Well, well yeah, it, there's a light bulb inside this battery. No, there isn't. It's a fuse. <laughs> Damn, he was lucky. Yeah, well, there, yeah, it's just one of those things that, uh, but again, a lot of times um, maintenance can, can alleviate that problem. Of course, storing it properly can alleviate that problem. So, a little TLC goes a long way just for. for uh, and, and we're talking about the whole premise of our company is to, to, to try to save some money. But for me, it was I'm lazy, and I got my toys. And when I go home, and I I, I want I want to just drive. I, I want my snowmobile, and I want my my lawnmower up in Michigan to work, and I want my, my cars when I when I go back to the factory and my cars are. I want them to start, and I don't want to screw with batteries. I don't like them. They're nasty things and stuff. And you know, and so I just want my stuff to start. Well. There are some things we can do. Now, what we can't do is stop the companies from making cheaper and cheaper batteries and, and trying to make them last a couple of years because they could make a battery that lasts 80 years like that. Now, let's, let's talk about a battery. This is before plastic. You know, this is fake lightning glass. Three inches of room from the bottom of the plate to the bottom of the glass. Why? So that the lead sulfate that falls down won't short out the plates. Okay. If you look at new batteries, what, one of the things that, uh, it's, been, it's been a while since I tore any apart, but about nine years ago when I was working on the algorithms for the pulsing and stuff, we took and, and we, uh, with, a, with a bandsaw, after quick cleaning out all the sulfuric acid and stuff, we, we, we bandsawed them to see how much sulfur we were getting. If, if, because the frequencies, what we're, what we're shooting for with pulse is, is two things, reversing and then the <coughs> resonant frequency of the lead plate. We're trying to get the plate to vibrate. It, it, all it is is an ultrasonic vibrator for batteries, but that's not easy to figure out. Nobody tells you that. There is, I've got guys that have come to me and said, oh, I saw a schematic for a pulse charger online. There's lots of them. What they don't tell you is all the different frequencies that you need to put out. You know, They tell you how you can put frequency out, but not how to pick it. Well, so, so we, we, we try these things apart and look for the amount of sulfation and stuff. One of the things I saw between a seven-year battery and a three-year battery, when I cut it apart, and uh, it is the distance between the bottom of the plate on the seven-year battery is about a half an inch. The distance between the bottom of the plate on the three-year old battery is about three sixteenths. Okay, well, why? And, and if you if you if you ever looked at the labels when they they don't have seven well they have prorated seven-year batteries but. They would say, oh, 99.9% .9 pure lead, better uh, plasticizers, hogwash. I mean, and, and, and the difference in manufacturing a better PVC for the battery thing and maybe the better lead might be 50 cents or maximum. I think the number one thing is just the distance on the bottom of the battery plates. They wanted them to short out, and they had it figured out. They know what they're doing. They're not stupid. I mean, they, they figured out the thickness of the place down to probably ten thousandths of an inch. I mean, uh, so that they would not last. There are no battery companies that I know that like any of us that are doing high-tech battery charging because we're messing up their formula. They want you to buy a battery every two years, period. Not, not buy one every five years. Yeah. They make a lot more money, and they're billion-dollar corporations and stuff. So it's the exact opposite. It's planned obsolescence. That's what we're dealing with. What we're dealing with most of the batteries made. Now, some of the higher-priced ones. They're putting a little bit better stuff in and stuff, but then they're making you pay twice as much. So, are the gel batteries susceptible to the same thing? With oh yeah, sulfation in the bottom. Yep, it's just exactly the same and stuff. Now, sulfation is going to the bottom. No, not as not as readily because it can't get through mm -hmm. the absorbed glass mat. But the absorbed glass mat is a porous thing, so yeah, and, you know, the stuff the stuff comes through. But <coughs> and, you know, sulfation or or, or um, the shorting plates. Happen more readily in a liquid battery, in a wet battery, than they do in a gel battery. Wait, you're
again, you're paying more money for a job back. Yeah. So, um, and for me, it's oh, what am I using it for? I mean, there are different types of batteries and stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at a motorhome, and they've got these very expensive, you know, six batteries in there, and, and you get the good ones, they're, they're a ton of money, but I'm going to get the good batteries because I mean, you know, I, for that application, I want the amp hours and I want AGM. They're the best. They're called Lifeline batteries, and they're a whole mess of money. I mean, when you're buying a bus conversion, it's you know, five thousand bucks for the batteries. Five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. Yeah. So I might get a better deal, but I'm not much. It's not from the. These are lithium cars you're coming out with. They're all lithium batteries. Well, now, okay. So now let's talk about lithium, and we, we make chargers for lithium batteries too, and stuff. Now, lithium is a whole different animal. It's got wonderful properties. One. You don't have to keep it charged up. You can leave, you can let it sit for a year and hurt it. They don't, they don't need to be kept at 100. They don't sulfate, but they do have a thing called dendrites, which are it's their it's their sulfation that happens. Them. Our, our charger, we use pulsing for that too, but we use it at totally different frequencies in order to slow down the dendrites. Um, but they are a great storage solution. The problem with them is they're they're expensive. You know, try to get one for a car. As a matter of fact, I make a charger that does these three thousand dollar lithium batteries for NASCAR and stuff. And and they, 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 so if you're a real expensive racing team, you buy the, these batteries. Why? They weigh nothing. They are not susceptible to temperature and stuff. So so they they got that advantage. Um, they, they 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 weigh nothing. They're 25 pounds less than a lead-acid equivalent. Well, 25 pounds might not sound a lot to us, but it's a real whole mess for a race car. And you say 25 pounds, it's 25 pounds. And it's harder. It's hard to break. It. You know, the, the vibration and the, you know, the, and the rigorous <coughs> temperatures and stuff are not. But you better be able instead of 150 dollars for your battery, you're spending 3,000 dollars for a battery. Not all of us can do that or want to do that. And stuff. Now, if you buy a brand new Ferrari, I understand, and if you buy a new McLaren, they've got lithium batteries in them. You got a three thousand dollar battery. So, so again, you want to make sure that you take care of those things. And um, if somebody will come out with, you know, I, I, I get all the battery blogs and stuff that are out there and stuff. And there's going to be some young students, in some college somewhere, because they're all working on it, that are going to come out with a better battery technology. Than and, and I don't know that it's going to be lithium. There's a if, if you Google dirt battery, one of the one of the head MIT professors is saying he can make the battery out of dirt. <laughs> dirt battery. Dirt. D I R T. Dirt. Okay. So uh, okay, maybe he knows something. Somebody <coughs> is going to go and, and, and now lithium. Let's talk about lithium. If I sell lithium jump starters, and I have been for about four years. The batteries that are in the lithium jump start, you don't hear about this, but they're three times more powerful than they were three years ago. They have a, a lot more protection, they're cell balanced, they got all these cool things, and, um, and, and for the same size, they've gotten three times as powerful. That's why these cars, electric cars can go so much further. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first Chevy Volt, I think, could go first time uh, 36 miles on the batteries on them. And the new Chevy Volt, I think, goes like three times that. So, same size batteries, you know, just they've made them better. That's just working on anode and cathode technology and the density of, of and working with lithium. But there's going to be somebody, and I hope it's in our lifetime. I like to see it. We're going to get some sort of energy, not not high, I don't know if other hydrogen cells, but some some other type of battery that that will, will be revolutionary. Whoever comes up with it, whatever school comes up with it. Can write their own future because it'll be billions of dollars. I mean, I mean you know, so you, you you know that every electronic physics department, actually physics is really where it's at, um, is working on it because whatever university does have, and they get a, a, a bunch of bright students in there to figure this stuff out, it's, they're gonna it pounds it. Wow, you know, and that will happen. There, everybody's working on it. Everybody, and it's, it's just a matter of time. And we're gonna see we're gonna see. Pretty cool stuff. That is, whether it affects our hobby or whether it affects us directly, I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't. I don't like electric cars per se. I like internal combustion. 
I like I like the ambiance. You know, there was actually there was a professor at least a Stanford professor who says, well, these car gas cars are gonna it's gonna avalanche and they'll be all gone in ten years. Here's a professor, you know, real smart guy. Well, he doesn't even own a car. He doesn't know the passion of driving a car, the fun of driving a car, how it's part of your life. He doesn't get it. He's out there because he's never, you know, he doesn't have a car. He doesn't. So no, it's not going to happen in ten years. We're not going to. You know, and it's going, to, it's going to be like, like you know, uh, uh, all of a sudden it'll be all electric, and then there'll be no cars. Uh, it'll be all Uber and stuff. And to a certain extent, actually, like our, our, my kids are in their thirties, high twenties, and uh, my daughter likes cars. My grandson likes cars, but my two boys—it's an embarrassment, you know. And I used to take them to all the car. Maybe it's because I took them to cars, but they didn't have it. I mean, I, I was born wanting a car. I mean, I made noise. I needed it. I, it's got a motor in it. I love it. Uh, uh, it's sad to see that that's probably going to change, but it's not going to happen in ten years. The cars are going to be cool forever. Yeah, yeah. Not in our lifetime. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, most of the people that are in the car culture are good drivers because they're into cars. And most of the people that are bad drivers are just a car is a means of getting from point A to point B. Right. They look at their cell phone and surf the web while they're driving. You know, one of my sons is a large garbage can. Right. I mean, <laughs> but that's a whole different. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, it's, it's, I'm glad I was uh, born in a period of time when we got to enjoy and still continue to enjoy these wonderful things. Mm -hmm. you know, um, 100 years from now, I'm sure it'll be different. But it's going to be different. What we like to do. Yeah, and I have all my fondest memories somehow you know, are around cars, and all my friends are cars. And that's another wonderful thing. So you know who they are, and they're, they think like you, and they're honest people, and you have this kind of love. Well, Dr. Ramon here, and I think we all grew up in about the times, you know, like yeah. 50, 60, and yeah. some 70s. And yeah. And there's yeah. certainly a lot of newer cars you see out there now. Yeah. 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 Anyway, well, any other questions? I, you said it's too hot. Too hot, too cold is bad for bad. Is there an optimal temperature for lead acid batteries to live in? Yeah, about 78. 78, yeah. So That's pretty bad is in the winter when you park the car. Yeah, <coughs> right. I mean, uh, so, so uh, again, if you're in a real cold area and you're not using it, it takes North a little cold. bit of... Cold. Yeah, right. So you, you bring them in. You bring them in to... And then, um, you can... There's not, also nothing wrong with daisy chain um, and making little small wire um, Cables that can jump your three or four batteries together. I do it all the time and stuff, and I have one charger on all four of those, and it's pulsing them and oh. keeping them alive. So, and even you, if you have Prand X's and the other ones, and as long as your power's full enough, you know, I'd say five amps would be a, a, a good one. And automatic, you can put four batteries together, put all the reds and all the negatives together. Now, what you don't want to mix is AGM batteries and lead acid, though. You can mix small and big. Um, no problems there, but uh, you, you wet cells together and AGM batteries together, and they can be smaller bit. And you put them in parallel, and you put them in your shop. And uh, oh, the other thing too, okay, you don't have to worry about sticking a battery on a concrete floor. That's an old wise uh, yeah, years ago. Years. Yeah, that came from when batteries had a rubber case. On. Well, okay, well, before rubber, when they were made out of wood. Oh, wood. First batteries before they even went to glass. The first batteries were made out of wood. And, stuff. and it, I happen to have a collection of vintage battery chargers, and, and uh, I've got a few batteries and stuff that are. I got one wood, not partially left, because they put tar inside to, to, in order to insulate the cells and stuff. And, and uh, now, there you can leach electrons from one cell to another if you've got a wood battery. If you're not running on wood, however, as soon as you go to glass or any other insulator, or especially today, you're not going to do anything other than temperature. Now, the only reason I would take something off the ground uh, is if the temperature was really cold or colder, and usually on the ground it is, but, but the difference between the ground and rock directly, it's not that much. Um, and, and, and or hot, but other than that, no, you're not, the battery doesn't go dead faster, nothing happens to a battery. It's PVC, it's the same stuff that, you know, I'm building a new garage right now and they're putting the lines in the underground. PVC. It's not going to have to be affected by anything. <clears throat> what well, vintage is the last battery? I, I think that's about 85. 
And, and what that was was either on a farm, it was one cell out of, if you had a, 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 a place, a farm or something like that before we got power lines, you would have a bank of those. They're, they're two volts each, so you might put 20 of them together. You would have them wired up to your light bulbs and your things that you run at night. And you would either have a windmill with a generator on them, and stuff, or you have one of those single lung, you know, pumpers, you know, just pump it away um, during the day while you were generating electricity, and you're running on DC stuff, and, and that's that's how they how uh, now uh, uh, switching stations had them. Um, there's a variety of things they used them on. Yeah, uh, but yeah, and they they and now of course there's no batteries out there in those places. They're not yet. This is before you had glass, and so they did. Now, they, they built these to rebuild. I, I, I um, took a car tour up in Northern California to a big train depot. And diesel trains, the diesel runs a, a, a generator, the generator uh, charges up the batteries, and, um, and, that's, how you, and, and that's how you get your, your, your train to work. It's not just diesel direct, it's diesel to batteries. But the batteries are, <laughs> Are just big, and one of the things that they showed at the train people is they still pull the battery plates up with big crane, and they clean them, and they rebuild them. They used to rebuild batteries; they were called tar top batteries if they were car batteries and stuff. And they rebuilt all these. Nobody thought about, uh, and the plates were thick. Nobody thought about uh, uh, obsolescence. You wanted to make it last. So what you do? You clean them now. Back then, I'm sure they knew what they were doing when they were cleaning the plates, or they would burn through everything that they got. And um, but that's what you did. You didn't throw stuff away. It could last. And, and those big train batteries. I asked the guy, and he goes, "Oh, they're about fifteen thousand bucks, and it's a lead acid battery. It's just a bunch of lead, you know, a bunch of plates and stuff." Mm -hmm. But they don't throw them. Away. Years ago, the power, the telephone company, their central office had a room with all the power room. These things are like a 55 gallon drum, clear. And they were made cable batteries. Yeah. And they had 48 volt DC that got the entire switch. Back then, it was before electronics. Right. It was an electric switch. Right. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's storage and storage, and it's, uh, it's been around a long time. That's why, like I say, with, with a lot of people don't know that generators put out two voltages, they don't. They don't know that alternators put out two voltages, but they've seen that. I mean, when you, when you, when you start a car and it goes to 14.4, that's not, they can't leave it there very long. But that's on purpose to make bubbles. The reason they do that is for bubbles. That's, you know, it's gas yeah. in the battery. Can you jump start a six volt with a 12 volt? No, <laughs> not at all. Okay, I, I get guys that buy my jump starters and they do that. You, you got, you're, uh, I'm not one with heights and, and uh, tight ropes. Um, if you're fortunate and you don't have anything turned on uh, and the, the voltage of the 6 volt battery is low enough, when you put a 12 volt onto a 6 volt, like a jump box, it will come out to around 8 volts. Okay, with the 6 volts down to 4 or something like that. Okay, that's, that sounds reasonable, right? So you try to start it, it starts. As soon as you start it, however, and your generator starts putting in some excess stuff, you'll spike up to 12 volts. And if you've got anything on that's running on six that is all of a sudden spiked up to 12, you're gonna burn it up. So it's, so whatever's on the no, What I tell people to do, and this is what I do when I'm, I got a six volt car, I bought myself a spare Optima six volt battery. And if you, if you wanna see what one looks like, I have one in the booth, and it's awesome because it will run my car, it's half the size of a normal battery, puts out a ton of amps, and um, I can put it in the trunk. And if I have a problem with a six volt car, it, I can either, and, and it's really bad, the battery's really bad, I just take the other battery out, put this thing in and stuff, and bungee it in place, because it's smaller than my normal battery, and I got myself a six volt battery. I can use a set of jumper cables with it, and jump the other battery, and I'm never screwing around with with anything higher that would hurt anything, including you know, ob obviously the coil, the condenser, and those kind of things. They don't want 12 volts on. They, they just, you know. So now when we're doing 90 volt batteries, I'm surprised you didn't realize that. Yeah, they're, they're um, I, 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 my six volt cars are six volt cars. I left them six volts. I have an Optima in one of them. 
because it's a hard starting car. And you can actually put two Optimos in the same space. So if you've got yourself a big Packard or something that's an old, old car that's six volts, uh, you put two of those, you can weld with them. I mean, they're just, you know, you've got over a thousand cold cranking amps. And, and so that's another alternative to going to eight volts. Um, well, as soon as you go to eight volts, well, you've got to change things. And, and then you've got to worry about your light bulbs are made for six volts. So if you're going to tour, and I like to tour, you wouldn't want to run eight volts on, on a bunch of six volt light bulbs for a long time. They're going to burn up. You know, so you're changing light bulbs a lot more than you used to. So. You go touring with a six volt car? Huh? You go touring with a six volt car? Oh, I, I've done, I, I'm a pretty crazy, stupid person, but I like it. So I, I bought, um, this is about eight years ago, I bought a Bel Air, a 54 Bel Air at Hershey. I drove it back to California. I'm six volt. On, so, it, was a six, it is a six volt car, it's 54. Yeah, so, anyway, thank you. Anyway, I think we have somebody else coming. Uh, uh, but thank you very much for showing up. If you did get a piece of military.